Today I read from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's sermon entitled The Drum Major Instinct. He gave this sermon on February 4th, 1968 at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And there is deep down within all of us an instinct. It's a kind of drum major instinct, a desire to be out front, a desire to lead the parade, a desire to be first. Nobody is unhappy when they are praised, even if they know they don't deserve it and even if they don't believe it. The only unhappy people about praise is when that praise is going too much towards somebody else. But everybody likes to be praised because of this real drum major instinct. There comes a time that the drum major instinct can become destructive. If this instinct is not harnessed, it becomes a very dangerous, pernicious instinct. For, insti for instance, if it isn't harnessed, it causes one's personality to become distorted. I guess that's the most damaging aspect of it, what it does to the personality. If it isn't harnessed, you will end up day in and day out trying to deal with your ego problem by boasting. Have you ever heard people that you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've met them, that really become sickening because they just sit up all the time talking about themselves and they just boast and boast and boast. And that's the person who has not harnessed the drum major instinct. And then the final great tragedy of the distorted personality is the fact that when one fails to harness this instinct, he ends up trying to push others down in order to push himself up. And whenever you do that, you engage in some of the most vicious activities. You will spread evil, vicious, lying gossip on people because you are trying to pull them down in order to push yourself up. So the great issue of life is to harness the drum major instinct. Now the other problem is when you don't harness the drum major instinct, this uncontrolled aspect of it, is that it leads to snobbish exclusivism. It leads to exclusivism. And you know, that can happen with the church. I know churches get in that bind sometimes. When the church is truly, is true to its nature, it says, whosoever will, let him come. And it is not supposed to satisfy the perverted uses of the drum major instinct. It's the one place where everybody should be the same, standing before a common master and savior. And a recognition grows out of this, that all men are brothers because they are children of a common father. The drum major instinct can lead to exclusivism in one's thinking and can lead one to feel that because he is some trainee, he's a little bit better than that person who doesn't have it or because he has some economic security that he's a little better than that person who doesn't have it. And that's the uncontrolled, perverted use of the drum major instinct. Now the other thing is that it leads to tragic, and we've seen it happen so often, tragic race prejudice. A need that some people have to feel superior. A need that some people have to feel that they are first and to feel that their white skin ordained them to be first. And think of what has happened in history as a result of this perverted use of the drum major instinct that has led to the most tragic prejudice, the most tragic expressions of man's inhumanity to man. The other day I was saying, I always try to do a little conver converting when I'm in jail. And when we were in jail in Birmingham the other day, the white wardens and all enjoyed coming around the cell to talk about the race problem. So I would get to preaching and we would get to talking calmly because they wanted to talk about it. And then we got down one day to the point, that was the second or third day, to talk about where they lived and how much they were earning. And when those brothers told me what they were earning, I said, now, you know what? You ought to be marching with us. You're just as poor as us. 
Now that's a fact, that the poor white has been put into this position where through blindness and prejudice he is forced to support his oppressors. And the only thing he has going for him is the false feeling that he's superior because his skin is white and can hardly eat and make his ends meet week in and week out. And not only does this thing go into the racial struggle, it goes into the struggle between nations. And I would submit to you this morning that what is wrong in the world today is that the nations of the world are engaged in a bitter, colossal contest for supremacy. And if something doesn't happen to stop this trend, I'm sorely afraid that we won't be here to talk about Jesus Christ and about God and about brotherhood too many more years. But this is why we are drifting. And we are drifting there because nations are caught up with the drum major instinct. I must be first. I must be supreme. Our nation must rule the world. And I am sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit. And I'm going to continue to say it to America because I love this country too much to see the drift that it has taken. God didn't call America to do what she's doing in the world now. God didn't call America to engage in a senseless, unjust war as the war in Vietnam. And we are criminals in that war. We've committed more war crimes almost than any nation in the world. And I'm going to continue to say it. And we won't stop it because of our pride and our arrogance as a nation. But God has a way of even putting nations in their place. The God that I worship has a way of saying, don't play with me. And brothers and sisters, that's the God we hear about in our first lesson today. Instead of leaving Eli despairing from the horrible sins his sons committed and the inevitable consequences, God also gave him and God's people young Samuel to tell it like it is, a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. I've also got to think that Nathaniel in our gospel lesson from John had the drum major instinct going strong when he met Jesus and he rebuffed him as being somebody lower than him because he was from Nazareth. But Jesus saw the good portion of that instinct and redirected it. The Reverend Dr. King's sermon text was from Mark's gospel. It was about the disciples coming to Jesus and, and asking him to be drum majors, sitting on Jesus' right and left hand in Jesus' time of glory, they asked. They think they got it right. Knowing what the, fo the prophets foretold, they hoped for empowerment instead of oppression. Didn't they deserve it? After all, when Philip gave Nathanael the shortest sermon ever, come and see, Jesus then told him, you will see greater things than these. He told him, you will see Jacob's ladder in me. Now, Reverend Dr. King continued his sermon. What was the answer that Jesus gave these men? It's very interesting. One would have thought that Jesus would have condemned them. One would have thought that Jesus would have said, you are out of your place. You are selfish. Why would you raise such a question? But that isn't what Jesus did. He did something altogether different. He said in substance, oh, I see, you want to be first. You want to be great. You want to be important. You want to be significant. Well, you ought to be. If you're going to be my disciple, you must be. And he said, yes, don't give up this instinct. It's a good instinct if you use it right. It's a good instinct if you don't distort it and pervert it. Don't give it up. Keep feeling the need for being important. Keep feeling the need for being first, but I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. That is what I want you to do. And so Jesus gave us a new norm of greatness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. 
If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And this morning, the thing I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. I know a man, and I just want to talk about him a minute, and maybe you will discover who I'm talking about as I go down the way, because he was a great one, and he just went about serving. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a poor peasant woman, and then he grew up in still another obscure village where he worked as a carpenter until he was 30 years old. Then for three years, he just got on his feet and he was an itinerant preacher, and he went about doing some things. He didn't have much. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never owned a house. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never went 200 miles from where he was born. He did none of the usual things that the world would associate with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. They called him a rabble rouser. They called him a troublemaker. They said he was an agitator. He practiced civil disobedience. He broke injunctions. And so he was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. And the irony of it all is that his friends turned him over to them. One of his closest friends denied him. Another of his friends turned him over to his enemies. And while he was dying, the people who killed him gambled for his clothing, the only possession that he had in the world. When he was dead, he was buried in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he stands as the most influential figure that ever entered human history. All of the armies that ever marched, all of the navies that ever sailed, all of the parliaments that ever sat, and all of the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. He didn't have anything. He just went around serving and doing good. Every now and then, I guess, we all think realistically about that day when we will be victimized with what life's final common denominator, that something we all call death. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. Yes, Jesus, 
I want to be on your right or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. 